Welcome to a very special sermon here at 242 Community Church. If you've been watching for a while, you know that we tend to typically teach in series that go about four weeks or six weeks or something like that. But every so often we like to do these one-off sermons and, and we just call them mixtapes because if you remember growing up listening to the radio and making your own mixtape, you'd, you'd find that one special song that just kind of stood out and, and so you hit record to catch it real fast. And, and so if you go through the vodcasts of this year, you'll find a, a mixtape pop up here or there. But this is the first one for 2016, so we welcome you guys to mixtape. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, old time is still a-flying. And this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. Thank you, Mr. Pitts. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. The Latin term for that sentiment is carpe diem. Now, who knows what that means? Carpe diem. That sees the day. Very good, Mr. Meeks. Meeks. Another unusual name. Seize the day. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Why does the writer use these lines? Because he's in a hurry. No! Ding! Thanks for playing anyway. Because we are food for worms, lads. Because believe it or not, each and every one of us in this room is one day going to stop breathing, turn cold, and die. I'd like you to step forward over here. Peruse some of the faces from the past. You've walked past them many times. I don't think you've really looked at them. They're not that different from you, are they? Same haircuts, full of hormones, just like you. Invincible, just like you feel. The world is their oyster. They believe they're destined for great things, just like many of you. Their eyes are full of hope just like you. Did they wait until it was too late to make from their lives even one iota of what they were capable? Because you see, gentlemen, these boys are now fertilizing daffodils. But if you listen real close, you can hear them whisper their legacy to you. Go on, lean in. Listen. You hear it? <clears throat> You know, I can't watch that clip from Dead Poets Society without reflecting on the fact that I only have one life to invest. At some point, I'm going to be food for worms, pushing up daisies, right? And, and it's the same is true of you. You have one life to invest. And, and so immediately, you, you sort of get into a frame of mind watching something like that where you begin to reflect on the past and how things have gone up to this point, whether you're 20, 30, 45, whatever, you know, 50, whatever, you start to think about how have things gone up to this point? And then you begin to imagine, looking forward, are there things that I want to change? Are there things that I want to be different with this one life that I have to invest? It's not just this movie clip that we watch. It's really kind of this time of year that we do the same thing. It's kind of a time of year that we are in this frame of mind where we look back over the year that's happened, right? All the news programs are putting out, you know, best of 2015 or all the top news stories of 2015. Facebook is going, this is the highlights of your life in 2015. And then it's also a time where most of us are thinking, okay, in 2016, what do I want things to be like? What do I want to change? What do I want to improve? What do I want to, what do I want to get better at? 
And so if you find yourself sort of looking back and looking forward and examining your life at this time of year, I want to suggest to you what I think might be the most dangerous word in the English language. The most dangerous word in the English language. Now, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be looking at Exodus 8. That's where we're going to find our word. If you don't have your Bibles, you can you know, look on your cell phones or whatever, or we're going to put uh, some of the scriptures up on the screen as well. But in Exodus 8, the Israelite people, God's chosen people, are in captivity to the Egyptians, and they've been that way for 400 years. And so like most uh, folks that are enslaved, what they want is freedom. And this sets the stage for probably one of the most amazing uh, labor disputes uh, ever, okay? Where, you know, you have management that's represented by a guy named Pharaoh. He is in charge of everything. And uh, he runs it all. And he is very interested in making sure that the labor contract that the Israelites have stays in place. This is what he wants, these slaves. And on the other side, you have the Israelites, uh, and they want to make sure that the contract changes because their, their labor contract is horrible, guys. These guys, uh, they work all day, every day, for free, with no vacation, and then they die. Like, that's a really bad contract. Now, one of the things that they have on their side is a labor negotiator named Moses, and Moses, uh, he used to have some pull with management because he grew up in the house of Pharaoh, but now that influence is kind of waned. Luckily, or fortunately, um, he does have some, um, some bargaining chips in the fact that he represents the creator of the universe, God. God has sent Moses to negotiate on behalf of the Israelite people to Pharaoh, and God has given him some bargaining chips called plagues. And when Moses goes to Pharaoh, he says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no way, it's not going to happen. And then Moses puts a plague on him. And then Pharaoh says, oh, okay, you can go. But then he changes his mind and then puts, Moses put another plague on him. And plague after plague after plague. And if you know the story, it's ten plagues. And then finally the Israelites are allowed to leave. And these plagues are horrible. I mean, this is the Nile River turns to blood, and when all of your water and irrigation and you wash and you drink and everything comes from the Nile River, that turning to blood, it's horrible. And they had the, the, the plague of the gnats and the plague of the flies and the plague of the locusts and the plague of the boils, just all these horrible plagues. But the plague that I want to look at is in Exodus 8, verse 6, and that's where we're going to find what I think could be the most dangerous word in the English language. If you look in verse six, it starts out this way. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, pray to the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people and I will let your people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, okay, well, then I'll leave to you the honor of setting the time setting the time for me to pray for you and your officials and your people that you and your houses may get rid of the frogs except for those that remain in the Nile. Tomorrow, Pharaoh said, and that's the word. That is what could be the most dangerous word in the English language. Tomorrow. Because you want to look at Pharaoh and go, wait a second. He said you can pick the time and, and you pick tomorrow? Why tomorrow? Why not, why not now? I mean, these frogs are everywhere, guys, okay? I mean, I, I know that you can handle uh, a frog jumping across your yard. You can probably handle that. But understand the amount of frogs that are here. In verse 3, back up in verse 3, it says, The Nile will teem with frogs. They will come up into your palace and into your bedroom and onto your bed. You don't need an alarm clock anymore because when you wake up in the morning, you're going to wake up to ribbit right on your pillow. Okay, these frogs are everywhere. It says, into your houses of your officials and on your people. On your people. Have you ever, like, gone outside and seen on your window a little frog just stuck right there? Have you seen that? Is it just my house? But I see these frogs. They're not going to be stuck to your house. They're going to be stuck to your forehead. These frogs are everywhere. I mean, it, it, officials are on your people. And in your ovens 
And in your kneading troughs, the frogs will go up on you and your people and all your officials. It's disgusting. When you open up your microwave, rib it, right? When you're back in your chariot out of the garage, you're squishing frog after frog after frog. When you get up in the middle of the night and you have to relieve yourself, you go sit down on the, the throne, we'll call it. Uh, you, you, you hear something swishing around in the bowl, right? It's disgusting, all right? But here's why I say it, because tonight... When you have to get up in the middle of the night and relieve yourself, when you sit down on the throne in the middle of the night, you're going to remember this message. (laughs) That was a teaching tool that I just implemented. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Anyway, okay, so you get the picture. (laughs) Tonight it'll happen. I'm serious. All right, so here's the deal. You get the picture. These frogs are all over the place, and Moses offers to get rid of the frogs, and Pharaoh says, nah, (laughs) let's just do it tomorrow. Why? I mean, does he just love frog legs? From the south, you know, frog legs are good, right? Is that it? No, I don't think so. Could, could it be that he's a, well, he's not a cat person, and he's not a dog person. He's a frog person, right? He just he wants frogs as pets? No, I don't think that's it. What is it that would motivate Pharaoh to say tomorrow when he could resolve the issue today? At first you hear that and you go, man, Pharaoh, you're just nuts, But then you pause, and you think, well, wait a second. Maybe Pharaoh's just typical. Because you hear about the guy that goes to the doctor, and the doctor says, hey, man, your liver's on its last legs. You need to watch it. And the guy goes home, and out of the stress of that appointment, says, man, the only way I can deal with this is to knock back a few more beers. Is somebody that even though, uh, the, the, even though this thing is killing them, to have one more escape, one more bit of pleasure, they decide to live with the frogs one more day. Or the person that's drowning in debt, and it's destroying their self-esteem, it's destroying their peace, it's destroying their relationships, and yet because of stress or whatever, when they're out, they just want to buy one more toy that they can't afford and they don't need, but they throw it on the credit card one more time and decide, I know I'm going to get around to it someday. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to get organized, but just one more day, I'm going to live with the frogs. It's the addict that takes one more hit, one more puff, one more look, just one more time, one more day with the frogs. The Greeks had a word for it. They called it ekresia. That's where we get our word crazy. You see, people have been doing this for thousands of years, doing things that they know will eventually harm them. But going ahead and doing it now because it's going to give you that one more instantaneous pleasure, one more instantaneous escape. It's acresia. Moses says to Pharaoh, you don't have to live with the frogs anymore. But Pharaoh begins to think, well, if I lose my workforce, well, my profit margin's going to go down. My profits go down. My lifestyle may have to change. The the people might think I'm less of a ruler because I'm not producing as much. And if I have to go to your God for help, people are going to think maybe I'm a weaker person. And so instead of going to God, well, let me just hold on to these frogs one more day. Maybe I'll figure something out on my own. Maybe something will change. Maybe something that I don't see. I just just don't want to go to God yet for help. And so let me hold on to these frogs one more day. Pharaoh figures he can tolerate a frog-saturated life. I mean, you can't have much joy with a frog-saturated life. You don't have much peace of mind with frogs hopping everywhere. But hey, it's not like it's a plague of alligators. You ever think about that? Or am I the only one that reads the Bible in a weird frame of mind? But I think to myself, why 10 plagues? I mean, if he started off, if Moses had started off with a plague of alligators, I'm telling you, it'd have been all over. They'd have been like, alligators, that's it, go, right? But it's not, it's flies, it's gnats, it's locusts, it's boils, it's things, that, it's frogs. It's, it's like, you know what, it's, it's an ugly little nuisance. I don't like it, but I can live with it at least for one more day. It might be the most dangerous word in the English language, this this word tomorrow. 
if I had to describe it, if I had to define it, I would call it spiritual procrastination. James 4, 17, I think, speaks to it. James says, anyone then who knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. So if I know the good I ought to do, quit the drinking or get to the gym or, or go to the doctor or, or give myself a break or accept forgiveness or extend forgiveness or whatever, if I know the good I ought to do but I don't do it, that's a sin. But it's not just about me. It's like if I know the good I ought to do, provide for the, the poor, serve my neighbor, love my enemy, and yet I don't do that, that's a sin. It's knowing the good I ought to do. I, I put it off for one more day, I, tomorrow. And can we just do kind of a mass confession? Because I, I, I don't think I'm the only one. I mean, I think we all deal with this. Can you kind of put your hand right here, ready to raise it, okay? If as a student, now I'm going to go through all of these, and then at the end you can raise your hand. If as a student you ever put off studying for an exam, or writing a paper, or pulled an all-nighter, if you've ever delayed answering a letter, answering a text, a telephone message, writing a thank you note, paying a bill, or balancing your checkbook, if you've ever, if you have desk, if you have, uh, if at your desk at work, you have any work tucked away that you're putting off to another day. If you've ever purchased a Christmas gift on December 24th, if you've ever watched a news report on April 15th as people get their tax return in on the day it's due and thought to yourself, man, I wish I had it together like those people. If you've ever put off going on a diet, doing home repairs, getting your oil changed, seeing a doctor, going to a dentist, if you've ever said by any of these things, I'll put up with the frogs just one more day, I'm going to procrastinate, then raise your hand. Oh, look at that. Doesn't that feel good to get that off our chest, you know? It's like we're going to church with real people. Now, how many of you are going, man, that's a little bit personal. Can we just put off till next week talking about this? <laughs> See, for most of us, the problem is not that we don't know what God wants us to do. I mean, I know there are times in your life where you're going, man, what I need is a message on how to know the will of God. I don't know if I'm supposed to go this way or that way, that school or this girl, uh, that school or this school, this girl. Or that. <laughs> it's my life story. I'm revealing it to you. I don't, know, I don't know if I should make this investment or that investment, this partnership or that partnership. God, show me which way to go. For most of us, there are times like that in our life. But for most of us, most of our life, it's not, it's not that we don't know what to do. We, we know what to do next. And for most of us, it's not the issue that we wake up and say, man, I am going to rebelliously refuse to do God's will. I today will choose evil. That's not you. You're good people. It's not the issue that we don't know what to do or that we just decide rebelliously to refuse. The, the issue is we know what to do. We just can't seem to get around to it. We just can't seem to get around to doing the right thing. We always just push it off till tomorrow. Life happens. Schedules happen. Other things pop up. And next thing you know, it's not that we said no to God, we just said tomorrow. And so my question for you is, is there anywhere in your life as you look back over the last year and as you look forward to the next year, is there any area of your life where you're saying to God tomorrow when you should be saying today? Hebrews 3.15 says, do today if you hear his voice. Do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Hebrews 3.13, but encourage one another daily as long as it's today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Guys, today is all we've got. And we make our plans for next week and next month and tomorrow and all that kind of stuff. But you know, today's all we're assured. I don't have to give you stories of people that thought they had tomorrow and then didn't. We all know those stories. The truth is, none of us are promised tomorrow. And so today, if you hear God's voice saying, hey, in this area of your life, in this thing, I want you to take your next step with me. Then will you do it and not put it off? 
With the time I have left, here's what I want to do. So I just want to give us some common areas where we sometimes say, you know what, I'll put up with frogs in that area of my life. Or I will spiritually procrastinate in that area of my life. And let's just listen together, sort of a spiritual exercise to the voice of God that might be speaking to you about an area of your life. First area, I would say, is probably the habits that we have, the behaviors in our life. I don't know about you, but there are some areas of my life that I keep coming back to. I find myself saying, God, I'm sorry, I'll never do this again. And then sometime in the future, I find myself, I'm sorry again, and I will never do this again. And it can happen three, four million times. (laughs) Is that you too? Well, I want to change that. I want to get better in that area. It could be for you, it's uh, truth-telling. You're just kind of a deceptive person if the truth be told. You you exaggerate to try to impress people. You fudge the numbers to try to make things work. um, When you find that you're about to get into trouble, your go-to defense is, well, just fudge the truth a little bit. You're a liar. And maybe that's something that needs to change this year. Maybe you're somebody with a judgmental spirit, and you walk around kind of going, you know what, I ain't the best, but I ain't like them. And why can't they get it together like I have it together? You're just kind of a judgmental spirit or an arrogance or a pride. Or, or maybe you're somebody that, that's on the opposite end of that. You're a, a spirit of jealousy. And you walk around kind of going, man, God, I know you've blessed me with this and that, but why can't I have what they have? Why can't I have what they, why can't I be who they are? Maybe for you it's some area of, of uh, anger. Maybe it's anger. You sort of live your life at the boiling point. And, and, and you may not realize it, but ask some of the people around you. And they can tell you, yeah, man, you're like, you're angry all the time. Or maybe some area of fitness. So some area of, of, uh, of habit, some, some addiction that you have. Can this be the year that we, we kick it or at least get better? And can I just, you know, how do you do that? Well, I, 1 John 1, 9 says if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us of our unrighteousness. Like he can forgive us, but then also help us get over it. Maybe there's a verse in the Bible that applies to your area of life that you need to kind of take and memorize and hold on to. Maybe for you, one of the action steps would be that you just tell somebody. I mean, it's a churchy word. It's a biblical word, confession. But, you know, what if you just had a friend and you say, hey, man, I just, I'm not prioritizing my kids the way I want to. Will you ask me about this like a month from now? Because I'm going to try to be home more than I'm not home. And just let them hold you accountable. Or maybe it's more serious than that. And you need to talk about it with a counselor. Or a pastor. Or a, maybe somebody that came with you today. Just say, hey, I've got this area in my life. I've got questions about it or I need help. Can you just pray for me? That's a good action step. Let me give you another one uh, that I've been thinking about recently. is the idea of guardrails. You know, we, where do we put guardrails? We put guardrails not on the, like the flat areas where like if you go off the road, eh, it's kind of bumpy and you might damage your car, but it's not that bad. We put guardrails in the place where like if you go off the road there, you're done for, right? So it's better to go ahead and put a guardrail there even though you might scrape your car or it might be not good because it's going to keep you from going way off. Maybe you need a guardrail like a password on your computer that only your spouse knows. You say, well, that's kind of inconvenient. Well, yeah, it is. It's just like a guardrail. Hitting a guard is kind of inconvenient, but it keeps you from going way off the deep end. Or if, if, you, uh, if you like to drink, you know, you like a, a beer or, or 12, maybe you, need to, maybe you need to, with your friends, say, hey, you know what? We're going to go out, and I'm cool with that but like no more than one or two drinks, or, or like two. I don't know what you can handle. Maybe one. I don't know. But like if you see me order number three, you, you take that fork and you just right here, okay? 
because I can't do it. I can't. So I need you to be my guardrail. Do you understand the stuff that I'm talking about? Maybe, maybe a guardrail is to go home and to take those procrastination cards, credit cards. It really should be called procrastination cards because you're just putting off what needs to happen till tomorrow. Maybe you just need to cut those babies up. A little plastic surgery. That's what I like to think of when I think plastic surgery. You just cut those things up because they get you in trouble. And that's a guardrail. Or somebody one time told me they took their credit cards so they wouldn't do like impulse uh, debt. They'd take their credit cards and they'd freeze them in a block of ice. So like if they wanted to spend money, they had to take it out and wait for the thing to stop. I don't know. Maybe a guardrail. Maybe, you, um, maybe it's something in this second area. What about work? You know, a lot of us procrastinate in work, or maybe it's school for you, or, or what is your work? Is your work a, a job, a career? Is your work school? Is your work uh, uh, taking care of a family? You know, what is your work? Whatever your work is, we have a tendency a lot of times to procrastinate, put off in our work. I was thinking about this uh, an hour ago when I was putting this message together, and... Um, <laughs> And there's some great verses on this. Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, whatever your hand finds for you to do, do it with all your might. Colossians, Paul says, work diligently as though you're working for God and not for men. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, so whether you eat, drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Is there some area of your work where you've let the standard of excellence slip? Get it back up there. Maybe your attitude towards your boss, your coworkers, your customers. Man, if these people ask me that question one more time. You know, maybe your attitude needs to be changed to, so that what, whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, you're doing it all to the glory of God. Maybe it's an integrity thing. Maybe last month you fudged the numbers to try to get those last bonuses in before the end of the year. You don't need to do that. Because guess what? It, Paul says it, you're supposed to be doing it as though you're working for God. So don't impress your boss. Act like you're working for God. He sees the numbers anyway. Uh, speaking of numbers, you know, finances is one of the areas that we, will, that we will put things off. And I'm a big believer. You know, um, I'm a big believer in a 10-10-80 plan. Uh, 10% to God, 10% savings, and we live on 80%. And live on 80% so we're not, you know, debt, 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 debt. We actually live on that 80%. And I, I really believe that most of our anxiety around money would go away if we followed that simple plan over time. So that, you know, we live on 80% so we don't have to worry about so much debt. We save 10% so we don't have to worry so much about the future. And we trust God with 10% because 90% with God's blessing is better than 100% without it. Is there some area of your life where you're putting off till tomorrow, where you're saying, hey, you know what, I'll get to that. When I get the car paid off, then I can do savings. Uh, you know, um, generosity that's going to happen as soon as I get a raise as soon as we get through these renovations then I'll I'll, I'll close the uh, the line of credit don't put off till tomorrow what God's asking you to do today and then finally it's my last one and this might strike you as weird but this is what God's doing in my life right now don't put off joy till tomorrow Psalm 118, 24 says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This day with all of its imperfections. This day with all of its stresses. This day with all of its monotony. This day with all of its disappointments. But this is the day the Lord has made. And so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, I can't choose joy today because I've got guilt in my life. So I'm going to put off joy till a later time. I don't deserve joy. You know what? I'm going to put off joy until my circumstances change. That's not biblical. That's just happy. 
you know, happy with the root word happenstance, which is like, it may happen, it may not. If things are, if your circumstances are good, then you're happy. If your circumstances are bad, then you're not happy. But joy is something different. Joy is rooted in larger truths. Your joy is rooted in your relationship with God. And therefore, it doesn't change. And you can always choose joy. You know, there was a guy named Paul who was living in a prison. And as he was living in this prison, this is a prison that doesn't know, you don't know if you're going to get food the next day. You don't know if they're going to execute you the next day. And yet Paul comes and he writes the letter of Philippians where in chapter 4, verse 4, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. I'm going to say it again. Rejoice. That's what he says. Rejoice. And like it's a choice. Not like it's a feeling based on your circumstances. It's like, no, it's something that you choose. And so today, as we look forward to next year, I would love for you to choose joy. I don't know what you walked in here with. I don't know if you walked in with doubts. I don't know if you walked in with hurts. I don't know if you walked in with a past or whatever. But I would just encourage you to choose joy. How do you choose joy? Will you choose the things that bring joy? God says, you know what? Be with my people. That's going to bring joy. God says, worship brings joy. Let's bring joy. His truth brings joy. Open up, crack open a Bible every once in a while. These things bring joy. God gives you the gift of family. That should be begin to bring joy. Nature, joy. He created you with different interests. Hobbies can bring joy. All those things rooted in God bring joy in your life. You can have joy in the midst of of tough circumstances because you're focused on a greater truth. I want to give you the opportunity to choose a little bit of joy today. Will you stand up with me? Let's just stand up together. We are a people that have been given a body by God, a voice by God, a mind that God's. We should have so much joy. We're going to have a little joy today. We're going to sing about it. We're going to dedicate 2016. It's going to be the best year we've ever had as a family. All right, the best year we've ever had. And we're going to start this song, or we're going to sing a song, dedicate the year, but we're going to start the song with a little poem. A little poem. And I need your help with the end of the poem. All right, so be ready. It goes like this. Procrastination is my sin. It brings me pain and sorrow. I know that I should give it up. In fact, I will. Come on. Come on. All right, I'm going to give you another chance. I'm going to give you another chance. <laughs> Procrastination is my sin. It brings me pain and sorrow. I know that I should give it up. In fact, I will. <laughs>